Thank you for joining us this afternoon. And uh, as, as uh, Donna mentioned, the slides will be available. And um, I'm just glad you're going to come and join us on a little bit of a journey here. So the official title of this is How Do You Build a Knowledge Management Enterprise Level Program System Approach um, That is Long-Term Sustainable? That's kind of the, was the original title. I just decided I'd go with Survive or Thrive. Um, now, it's not totally up to you, but it is largely up to you. The decisions you make around where you're going to invest, what you're going to describe knowledge management as, what your business case is going to be, to quote Stan Garfield, what business problem are you solving for? And the way in which you do the metrics and the way in which you're relentless in going after leadership to support you and the way in which you use the new technologies so that management has shiny objects to look at and goes, ooh, this knowledge management stuff is cool. Because talking to them about taxonomy usually just doesn't get their attention. <laughs> so, um, quick questions here. Has anybody had the, the, the top question? Surely by now everyone has got this knowledge management thing. When is it going to be self-sustaining? If you've had that question, raise your hand. Okay, four, three or four or five. You wish it would be as good as that, huh? <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll work that. Um, the second one, have we reached the tipping point where knowledge management just keeps rolling because, you know, you've got the tipping point, everybody gets it, knowledge management's just kind of natural now. Anyone, anyone had that? All right, yep. Well, at least your executives are reading some of Gladwell's books, albeit a few years late, so. All right, how much more time and money will it take to get knowledge management done? Sometimes they chuck in knowledge management done properly or done once and for all. How many of you have had that question? Yeah, a few more of them, a few more of them. And, and the video cannot see what you're answering, guys. It's okay, don't worry about it. This one is interesting. What is your plan if we're going to enter a recession? And I'm going to talk about recession planning. I hate the word, I hope it never happens, but I'm going to talk about it. I'm also going to talk about an, another way of looking at a, at, at a recession that is really good for knowledge management. How can you demonstrate your value especially if business slows down and sometimes they remind you you're an overhead. Okay, who's heard that one? A few of you, oh, a bunch of you. If you're in Deloitte, you should not be putting up your hand, Leah. <laughs> Can you make a recession-proof career in the business of knowledge management? I would suggest yes. Um, but, you know, that's why on the very first slide I said it's largely up to you. I may be here talking about how to do this, I've been doing internal knowledge management in Deloitte for 12 years. My colleague, John Callahan, who's chosen to go to another session, has do, been doing it for 20 years. He's our global chief knowledge officer. He has all the people. I'll talk about his core knowledge services, shared services area later. I'm in the business working with knowledge management. But you never know. I may be back next year as an independent consultant. Anything can happen. And you've got to be ready for that. One thing I know is if I am back as an independent consultant, it'll be because I've pushed too hard not because we didn't get a lot of stuff done, because the knowledge management team we have is, is truly remarkable. Um, and on that subject, I'd just like to wish Susan Prohinsky gets her voice back soon. Susan is the heart of our operation. She's the one who makes this all happen. She, her name was above mine, and she would have been co-presenting with me. But uh, just with no voice, it just kind of sucks to present. All right, so why do you have a knowledge management program? Pretty straightforward stuff. You've probably seen this before. Success is about addressing very specific business needs within a reasonable scope. Two things you should think about. One is knowledge management systems and services are usually built incrementally. There generally is not a big bang capability for knowledge management. It's coming because of AI. The closest we ever got to a big bang on knowledge management was when Google came out and we all got hit with a Google expectation for internal search. That's about the closest we've had. But knowledge management has been disrupted by lots of other stuff, but there, there, there hasn't been something that has made knowledge management just totally transform. You can't fast forward, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, just a reminder, and this is really old research, but I'll buy it for today and probably in the room everybody would. They studied 100, 1,078 knowledge management projects. When the projects were deemed to have failed, in 80% of the cases, the technology worked. I see some heads nodding, so that's, you've heard that as well. The technology generally works. It's the human factors that don't work. All right, so this is, the, this is the let's wake everybody up part of it. 
If your knowledge management program wants speed to market, please stand up. Nobody. Whoa. Up. Yeah, there we go. We're going to do the... Okay, very nice. Thank you. If your knowledge management program is speed to proficiency of your people, in other words, you're bringing in a lot of people, you need to get them trained up, or you're moving a lot of people from one type of business to another, or you will need to retrain your people, please stand up. All right, good stuff, good stuff. If your knowledge management program is about getting closer to the customer, building customer intimacy, please stand up. gets better and better. So that's kind of a big one. Okay, we'll focus a little bit on that in the presentation. If it, your knowledge management is about increasing the engagement with your people, in other words, people join you because they want a great education, they want to join other people who are smart, sort of like the Google effect or if you wish the Deloitte effect. Um, if this is your thing, please stand up. Getting closer to your people, increasing employee engagement. All right, thank you. Knowing what you know. If your knowledge management drive is primarily knowing what you know, a la HP, if only HP knew what HP knows and, and a few others, please stand up. All right, I see some of the big firms here as well. All right, improving internal processes to meet regulatory compliance, if that's your thing. Oh, lots of people. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Re-engineering, knowledge enabling your internal processes to improve efficiencies, decrease rework, stop reinventing the wheel. There we go. Okay. All right. So that's a huge one as well, right? How many of you are doing this with an AI component in it? You're allowed to stand up because that's huge. One person, one and a half, well, well, two, two people. There's the challenge. We are not moving quickly enough on AI and knowledge management. We really need to, we really need to get it going. Um, and there are a lot of kickstarters and fast starts that can help there. All right, who's out there um, taking advantage of new social technologies, building knowledge communities, the communities folks? Well, Gloria stood up first. Everybody met Gloria Burke, knowledge management community specialist. Go to listen to her at the table tomorrow. Um, catching up with a competitor who's just announced a big knowledge management initiative. Yeah, I thought nobody would stand up for that one, right? Yeah, w what are most of our competitors doing? They're providing us with new recruits. Um, it's not a good time right now for knowledge management in a couple of the big businesses where the big knowledge management shops are. Um, and so this is, this is not quite the thing that you're doing at the moment. But you will find in some of the smaller businesses, um, chasing a competitor who's just announced a really big knowledge management acquisition, especially if they're getting into some form of AI product, and that is, is going to be big. So if you're a 30 or 40 or 50 person firm, this becomes the thing. If your job is to build a website, a portal, or a content management system, if that's what knowledge management does in your organization, please stand up. Okay, thank you. Um, and the message I would have for you is let's make sure we add something else to that because that's not kind of what you want to be known for. When I go see a leader and they go, ah, you're the website guy, I'm, oh, this is not going to go well. You need to have something on top of that. And then finally, has anybody had the leadership request that says get better at knowledge management? Couple of hands, couple of, oh, and another name up there. Okay, so this is a long list, and it's deliberately a long list because these are all the things that you could do with knowledge management. I mean, don't limit yourself to being the website person who's trying to improve some internal processes. Go after the customer intimacy stuff. It's probably white space in your organization, and you might want to get into Salesforce anyway because it's a really useful second career if knowledge management doesn't work out. Um, Couple of things though. One is, you gotta pick a few. There was one gentleman who stood up to 11 of the 12, I think it is. That's gonna be tough, it's hard to pick. But if you peanut butter across everything, it's gonna suck, um, and you're not gonna get the leadership support you needed. All right, so for big professional services firms, we have one other one which is, is about not innovation per se, but identifying innovation packaging it up, validating it, and then getting other people to use it. Anybody want to guess what the hardest part of that is? Exactly. Yeah, Donna's right on. Yep. It's, it's identifying innovation, not hard. People talk about the cool stuff. Packaging it up, also not hard. Validating it, ah, not too terrible. And then getting other people to use it, heck no, we'd rather invent, invent stuff ourselves. One of the biggest challenges of this, but this is really what you need to do in big professional services firms, software firms, reusing code and putting knowledge into code um, and then sustaining it. So 
Just so you know, that's one of the others. I'm not going to go into what knowledge management is and isn't. It's a, it's a slide worth keeping on your desk in the morning and just taking a look at and going, so today I will make sure that I'm not that thing over on the right. So it's not about front office information portal. It's not about information overload. It's not about technology. It's not about one and done. It's all about changing leaders' attitudes, changing employees' attitudes. It's all about achieving your business goals, and that's really where it happens. And we've got the little visual here, and uh, if you go to see um, our robot, Pepper, you can see more of the visuals. Why do we do it? Our clients want us to do it. When you come to us, you're expecting us to bring the best knowledge from everywhere in the world. Everywhere in the world is now 300,000 people, plus a couple of hundred thousand people in alliances and, and other ways of working and software vendors and so forth. Our talent wants it. They come to us. Just how long do you think the average person stays at Deloitte? Just shout out a number. Four years. All right, 4.6 years. Okay. Folks are coming, they want an education, then they're going to move on, and we've got to be prepared for that, and we've got to be prepared to get them up the curve quickly. We've got to be prepared to make sure we capture the knowledge before they go and actually doing it while they're there. Um, we, we have to be competitive. Almost everything we do have to bid for. There are very few annuity contracts in our business, so that's a part of why we need it. And then we need to balance innovation and consistency. You know, they say innovation in accounting is an oxymoron, right? <laughs> so, yeah. But our previous CEO, who just did an absolutely lovely job, Kathy Engelbert, was talking once. She said, we have 12 audit innovation projects. All 12 of them are being successful. I don't think we're being innovative enough. That's great thinking. She's now, of course, the woman's NBA commissioner, um, which is just a wonderful job for Kathy, and uh, has retired from Deloitte. But that type of thinking about knowledge management is about innovation. It's about doing stuff differently. So this one, why do we have to keep proving this? Who has been asked recently to explain why knowledge management needs to be around? Okay, good, good. So, not good, but I got an answer. At least I hope I have. This thing seems to resonate, which is, you know, it's really logical and it's well researched that if you get enough sleep, if you exercise, you eat well, and you manage your stress, you will live a longer life. Okay. Well, if all it took was to know that that's the case, I would not look like this, all right? I mean, seriously, knowing this doesn't mean it happens. And that's the analogy for knowledge management. Just knowing that it's the right thing to do, and when people share and work with each other and cooperate and put their knowledge into the system, things are going to go better doesn't mean it's going to happen. Most of our leaders resonate with us. They go, yeah, now I get it. Um, so feel free to use the analogy anytime. So how many of you see yourselves as knowledge brokers? Please stand up if you do. Are you in the knowledge broking business, connecting these people with those people, getting them to share the knowledge? Little bits? OK. Unfortunately, now the world has moved, and you've got to be a knowledge broker plus, which means three things. One is you've got to deliver the knowledge to people before they even know they need it. We have sensing algorithms. We have tools that watch when people open a new project code and we ship them stuff. We say, you need this. We have all kinds of stuff that tells us, you should know that your client has just attended a Deloitte webinar. Um, you better reach out to them, connect in, see if they need any help. You should know that your client is connected with these people in Deloitte. And so you should possibly connect with them and find out what they're all doing. So we're pushing stuff to people. That's part one of the knowledge broker exercise. The second one is you do still need websites and shared spaces. You know, especially in our organization where we're adding 20, 30, 40,000 people, um, you need to have a place people can go to find stuff. So websites don't go away. The librarian curator role does not go away. You do need that. Um, but what you really need it for is to feed the other two systems. And then the third system, we call it D-Flow, Deloitte Workflow. The idea is to put the knowledge where people do the work. Right now, in most knowledge management, you go over here, and you check out a website, and then you go over here, and you do your work, whether that's a SharePoint site, or OneDrive, or Slack, or whatever it is. They're separate. We put the two together. You get provisioned with a D-Flow site when you're doing a pursuit, and it comes preloaded with all the stuff you need to win the work. I'll show you the numbers on that in a little while. It's kind of a fun way to do things, and I think our, our guys are showing a demo of it. But if you need one, please give us a shout. Um, and there's two kinds of knowledge in this. One is knowledge about process. So basically, how do you do this kind of project? 
I'm being asked to do a cyber threat analysis. Generally, how do I do it? So that's a Chevron model and shows the phases. And then there's knowledge in process. So I have done the initial assessment using the cyber strategy framework. What do I do next? Well, you print out the results and here's how you discuss each result with a client. And here's the ones you discuss with the CISO and here are the ones that you discuss with members of his or her team. So we provide both of those kinds of knowledge, the knowledge about process, the knowledge in process. Have to do that because otherwise you can't get solid metrics on the value you're adding. And we'll talk about that in a few seconds. So just one other thing, we're talking about knowledge management because some of you may be asking this is, if you could fast forward the movie, you know, can you get a lot of stuff done fairly quickly? It's been our experience, and I've, I've done knowledge management engagements with about 120 clients around the world. It's really hard to fast forward the movie. I know because I've been sitting there watching them go through the movie at normal speed and going, oh, we'll get there, guys, we'll get there. You really have to be willing to think about it differently, and a good way to do it is quick wins. Get a quick win, a focused win in one area, explain to people what you're going to do, show them the bottom line impact, show them other metrics, and you're, you're cooking. Um, and then you can get the snowball. I was going to say the money ball, but it's only dollars, so that one isn't really a, a good graphic for this. But uh, the question I would ask is, can your company afford to not have a world-class knowledge management organization? So the numbers I'm going to show you next have been heavily edited, but they're all directionally correct, and most of them are a bit lower than what they are today. This is what our leadership sees. $1.9 billion worth of work. Sounds like a lot, but, you know, we're a $38 billion organization. Is done using one or more of our methods and tools. 33,000 people have come to our sites. We only have about 28,000 people in the practices I represent, so people from other practices are coming in. 63% of our visitors came from outside the United States. Our knowledge exchange, 95,000 people addressed the knowledge exchange, came into the knowledge exchange. Um, again, 38,000 roughly people in our practice, so a um, lot more people coming from other practices looking at what we do. Cross-selling is a very big thing in our organization. Our pursuit centers of excellence have some huge win rates, $283 million. Um, we're training people on project management and governance because that's a hot topic in our organization. Um, and so we look at just the number of people who attended the training. It's harder to find another statistic. It's hard to say, well, the analysis of projects that didn't fail because we did project management governance training is a little hard to do. So we go with the number of people trained. We have a toolkit that is heavily downloaded, very heavily used, shows people how to use things. And then $170 million worth of work has been won using our DFLOW product. These are good numbers, but in the scale of big Deloitte, you know, which is 300,000 people, they're a drop in the bucket, and so there's plenty of room to run. The question I have with our leadership is how quickly are we going to run? How, more, how much more can we do, and how are we going to get it done? Because it's not about adding more knowledge management people. It's about being better at what we do using artificial intelligence and other technologies. And then finally, we have 601 client companies um, and 7,000 sites where we're sharing knowledge with our clients through our DFLOW and Deloitte Online system. So these are the kind of metrics you need to bring to leadership right to the business. They can understand clients, they can understand revenue, they can understand number of people trained in that and continue to be in their face about it. Um, it's not perfect. I still deal every day with people pushing back saying we're not sure the investment and knowledge management warranted or I went onto the Deloitte network and I couldn't find this one case study of something you couldn't find. Um, th those things are annoying, but you, you can't let them stop you from this picture. And they'll go, oh, I never go to the website. I go, well, 95,000 people do. And so that sort of, you know, tends to be one way of doing it. All right, let's look at things a different way. What if, when, and we hope it doesn't, but if the economy was to slow down, how about if you actually took some people who weren't as busy as they normally are, and put them into building intellectual property. Took a bunch of people and said, you know what, we need to increase our sales. You guys are some of our really good second tier salespeople. <laughs> go and build brochures, go and build content, go and put together mat materials that are gonna help us to sell. Um, if you're in the engineering business, take a bunch of engineers, write up the process diagrams, make sure your configurations are great. If you're in the customer service business, improve your scripts. Has anybody here ever tried this? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so 
So we did, in the, in the depth of the recession of 2008, we took 300 people in our valuation modeling practice and we got them to write standards on how to do valuation modeling. Very specialized area. Heather Harris sitting here is the leader of that practice. Um, 300 people signed off on the standards that they were a part of it, they contributed, um, and now our gross profit margins are 8% higher when people use the standards than not. And that practice has been one of our highest growing practices ever. So it, I not, I, we can't claim all the credit, but Heather and the team that built these standards get a large portion of the credit. So think about this, when your, when your leadership is coming to you going, you know what, it's not looking great, we just missed, missed our earnings plan, we're gonna need to think about cutting some overhead. This is where you hit them and you go, I got a better idea. Let me have some of your people who are a little bit underemployed right now. Let's use them to build you some really great intellectual capital in the areas or intellectual property or knowledge, collateral or materials, whatever you want to use the word, in the areas where you most need it. So if it's sales, build sales material. If it's quality of customer, if it's competitive intelligence, those are the things you want to go after. Give it a whirl, let me know how it goes. A couple of other things. There's a white paper I wrote and we never published back in 2008 on what not to do in economic downturn. So first thing is don't fire the boundary spanners. Most organizations did that. The way it works is everybody gets handed a 10% budget cut and their people look at their budgets and they go, well, Joe's been here a long time and Joe's not really focused on my business. He seems to be on all these cross-functional projects and everything. Let's fire Joe. He's expensive and he's not in my cost center focused. While Joe is the person or Mary is the person and it's often Mary, not Joe, that is actually connected across the business. Those are the per people you need at the exact time that things slow because they can pull together stuff from a number of parts of the business and give you a game changer. I see somebody nodding over there and going on board with that. Second thing is um, don't just assume your, your KM team should take a head cut, count, a head count cut because they're overhead. But at the same time, don't be shy about asking them to actually revisit what they're doing. If we sit down every time and we look at all the things we're doing, we're gonna find a bunch of vanity projects. Vanity project is where somebody wants you to build them a website so they can show it to leadership, or they wanna be able to show that they've done something in their part of the business. You wanna be very careful about avoiding those kinds of things. We also talk about school projects and stuff like that. So if things get tight, go to your knowledge management team and then go back to your leadership and go, hey, look at the list of projects we canceled. Oh yeah, by the way, your CEO portal, it's gone right? Make them hurt because they need to understand that as well. All right, let's talk briefly about structuring and staffing because I was asked to talk about what it takes to have a sustainable program and the biggest and most important part of our sustainable program um, is the people we, we have but then also the care and feeding and motivation and success of those people. Our job is to make our clients and our people successful. So we've gone with a federated model. Once upon a time we had a strong CKO, Tracy Edwards, she drove everything, she made it all happen, um, then she retired and we moved to more of a federated model, which means John Callahan has a team of six, 700 people, they serve our whole business, all of us get a piece of that, we pay, so it's not like he can go, oh, I'm sorry, I can't help you this month, it's an equation, um, and I'm one of the spokes in that, or well, I'm three spokes in that wheel. You do have some organizations that have worked well with the first among equals. A lot of the software companies, a couple of meritocracy-based organizations that are not professional services. In other words, organizations where you show how capable you are and then you become an HP fellow or something like that, have worked like that, which is you sort of have somebody who is selected to chair the knowledge management committee for two or three years at a time. They make strategic directions and that. And then finally, KM Inside, which is, we don't have a central organization for KM. It's in the departments, it's in the businesses. As a general rule, that doesn't work because the, the knowledge management sharing across businesses is important. So you can take a look at this. It's in the, the literature that we produce and there's a lot more on governance and what models work and there's some pros and cons here. But I did wanna just show you that we've thought about this. Um, and and the, our global model is, <clears throat> excuse me, core knowledge services, global shared services run by John Callahan. His job is optimization. His job is to make that thing run as smoothly as possible. Get content loaded, get websites built, find artificial intelligence technologies, search engine optimization. You might have heard Lee Romero from Deloitte speaking this morning. 
His job is optimization. Make it run like clockwork. And he's a Wharton MBA, um, so it's his thing. On the other hand, I'm an optimization guy. I'm out there going, sure, we can do that. Yeah, we can build that. Of course we can. Yeah, why not? Oh, by the way, we've decided we're going to get into the innovation business now. Oh, we've decided we're going to get into the regulatory compliance business. We're going to help you. So you need those kinds of personalities. We've worked together for a very long time, which helps. But there is an incredible tension that we built into the system to keep doing this. Because if you're not optimizing, not going to go places. You become an over, overhead and you're expensive for the organization. But if you're not out there maximizing the use of the stuff, you've got all this intellectual capital that you've collected, and instead of 3,000 people using it, you have 1,500 people using it. Just think of that waste. So you need to have both of those. Um, and for us, our shared services organization is a huge game changer. Um, it really has changed the way that we operate, um, and it's been a good one for us. You want to make your KM career recession proof. That was one of the other things that I was asked to talk about, and a lot of clients are calling me about this now. So firstly is suggestions. No guarantees. I cannot guarantee this because weird stuff happens in organizations, and you've just got to expect that. I mean, I've just got three new CEOs. Any one of them could have said, you know what, Adrian, I think it's time for me to bring in a new person. Nothing personal, just we need a new CEO. That's the way the world can work. Um, but... Let, let me suggest what you've got. If you can get your KM team close to the revenue, if you can get a direct causal link to revenue, you, you've got something really good. Secondly, if you can get a seat at the table right at the beginning, so have your network out, and if you're hearing about a new initiative, a great way of serving the customer, volunteer. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Getting choked up about making your careers recession-proof. So we measure our people by how many times they get a seat at the table. Lauren Danielson from our team is right there at the Chief Audit Executive Forum. She's running the show. She's making sure the content happens. Lindsay Williams from our forensics side is all over running our forensic and financial crime workshops because you've got to be close to the business and what the business needs. You've got to be at the table close to the revenue. Use your KM systems to broadcast opportunities. Get them out there and say to people, did you know about this? Here's something that can help you to be successful. Everybody's looking for an edge. If you're the one who gave them the edge, you've got a friend for life. They're going to remember you. They're maybe going to point other people to the system. Look at your CRM data, customer relationship management, Salesforce, wherever you keep the information on your customers, try and get your hands on that. Because if you can package up stuff that enables people to do better with the customers, there's some more recession proofing for you. And as I said before, Learn Salesforce.com while you're at it because it's a great second career if the KM thing doesn't work. Consider developing what we call selling corners. You know, here are these people, those people. If you put them together in the corner, they can sell better. Try and build some of those. Build guides and toolkits for new operations. If, if we are trying to build a new practice, we want to be there saying to them, guys, we can build you the collateral. Yes, we know, we haven't even won one project yet, but we can build you the collateral that's going to explain what we're going to do. We'll even pre-write the first client reference on what the client thought of the project because that's what you're going to deliver, guys. So get out in front of them. Um, videos, we love making videos. Our leaders like being in videos. Nowadays, you're shooting them with an iPhone. They really don't have to be expensive, and it's a great way of getting leadership presence. John's interviewed about 40 of our most senior leaders, and all of them have signed up to knowledge management. So when I go into one of their offices and they go, oh, you know, Adrian, I don't know, I go, let me show you your video. <laughs> Knowledge in a box kits. Um, that's, that's really a great way to help. Pull together stuff and say to people, here you go. How, how else can I help you? But it's branded as knowledge management or whatever you call yourselves, knowledge sharing, so forth. So um, think about it and find the most thorny business problems in your organization and go after those. As a general rule, people aren't chasing them, but if you were, I think you'd get some really good press and you'd be in a really good place. Any reaction to this? I saw some heads nodding. Anybody got any other ideas for how to recession-proof your career? Win the lottery? <laughs> okay. Let me know how it goes. Let's talk about, is KM a service? I talked about it, we have core shared services. But is KM a service or is it really a science or is it more of a calling? 
We believe knowledge management is a calling underpinned by science. It's the science of human behavior, the science of design, the science of artificial intelligence and robotics, but the people who do it have to be super passionate. It's a whole lot easier to do most jobs than knowledge management. Seriously, this is the path usually less taken, the road less traveled being in knowledge management. It's hard because it's so logical. Why don't you just get it done? And then you remind them about, well, it's logical, sleep, eat, exercise, stress management. Look at the way you look now, dude. Um, <laughs> it's not easy, it's not logical. We've chosen this path because it's exciting and it's fun. And you could have a lot of enjoyment with it. And we believe knowledge management has to be at the brain of your organization. It's got to be the enabler, but it's also got to be a driver. And that's really the important point. You've got to be an enabler first to try and help the business be successful. And at a certain point, you've got to go, you know what? They're not just going to pick it up and run with it. Heck with it. I'm going to get in front of them, and I'm going to drive this. And I'm going to ask leaders to support, and I'm going to get people to sign up. And that's kind of where you need to go with this. And then I talked about KM needing to be in the room where it happens, but I figured I'd get extra brownie points if I could get a Hamilton quote into this. I also promised my daughter I would do this. Um, so I'm now keeping a commitment. The Hamilton quote is in, but KM wants to be in the room when it happens. If you can be there right at the beginning, you can shape things, you can figure out what knowledge is needed, you can change the organization by getting knowledge sharing in from day one. So often people build stuff and then they go, oh yeah, we should probably get a website for this. Mm -hmm. Too late. You want to be there before it happens, or when it happens. This one I'm not going to talk about in a lot of detail. Um, I haven't got the, the Donna 10 minute signal anyway. Um, so couple of things here. Cognitive is not a tool anymore. Cognitive is a requirement. If you ain't got cognitive within the next year or two, probably not going to go well. Um, it, it's, it's just like being able to choose between a New York subway train and a high-speed train. The, the difference is just so huge when the cognitive technologies are employed. Um, that's really important. Um, and a lot of people are doing great stuff in the cognitive space because they're using what's already out there. There's a ton of cognitive capability in the cloud. Um, a lot of the organizations, so we did in Deloitte, we did a survey of CIOs, CTOs, who are spending more than $5 million a year on cognitive technologies and who believe they are successful. So there are about 2,800 of these folks, and we asked them how are they doing this? And you can read the survey, it's on the Deloitte.com website, where you can also subscribe to fun stuff about knowledge management if you wish. But key points they made is, number one, there's a huge amount of structured data already sitting in your ERP systems, your purchasing system, your payroll system, your accounting system, your finance system, your operations systems. Use that. It's structured data. It's easier to do stuff in analytics and cognitive with that. Secondly, use the cloud. There's tons of capability out there in the cloud. So, you know, after ERP systems, the next big area for them was using what was out in the cloud. And then have some experiments. Because your people want to start playing with the cognitive technologies because that helps to make their careers recession-proof, same way as it can make yours recession-proof. Um, and then I did speak last year or the year before about cognitive and, and the approaches people could take. And we just captured the one slide. Our job is to disrupt ourselves by making cognitive work on us. In a few seconds, I'll talk about a rule. Perfect, we got the 10 minute wave. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about a rule we call the 40% rule. I just call it the X rule here. Um, but you, you really want to think about how you can actually disrupt yourself, your, your organization, the way you do things to be better, radically better. And we haven't had a disruption for a long time time now, which is a few years in our business, that's a long time. And it's coming, and AI and cognitive, or it's already here, is really where it's going to happen. Secondly is, when I talked to people in the room last time, not a lot of them were shaping the future of AI in their business. If you are a knowledge manager in the room and you are shaping the way AI happens in your business, please stand up. Yes, well done. That is awesome. It's really great. If that's where you're going, you're in exactly the right place for being in the room when it happens. And if you have a chance, folks, to get into shaping it, that would be huge. Drive content. 
drive expertise identification, drive the pilots, drive the ecosystem. Pick the ones that matter to you. Because if you can be, you don't have to be the center of the cognitive engine, but if your team is involved because you provided the content. And when it comes to unstructured content, who owns unstructured content in an organization? Us, knowledge management. So when the unstructured content is either not available or it's poor quality, we're the ones they come and talk to and say that the AI models won't work because we don't have good data, clean data. And then finally, we heard a little bit of discussion about that this morning, this concept of trusting but verifying. Test to see that the cognitive system actually does what it's supposed to. Yesterday, Gordon Vallow Webb was talking about Carl Wieg, who said, think about what problem you're trying to solve and think about what you'd like the solution to look like because that's going to shape how you get your data. Now, that doesn't sound quite right, right? You'd imagine you just go grab the data and see what it tells you. Well, a lot of the data is biased, and we heard about that this morning. So trust but verify, stolen, I think, from, quote from Ronald Reagan, um, and then finding the right use cases, which means you've got to have a few of those innovation things that may not be successful because you can't make them all successful because then you're not pushing far enough. You're not out there at the edge of the envelope. And then the X equation, we said to our teams, guys, 40% of what you're doing today, you're not going to be doing in two years' time. I'm not going to tell you what the 40% is. You know much better than me what part of your job suck and what you don't like doing and what is inefficient. Fix it. Change it. Tell me how much you need me to help you to do things. So our team immediately built a whole lot of tools that will do a lot of the website building, a lot of the tagging, a lot of the loading, a lot of the managing of lists and stuff like that. Um, and then Pete, start, Pete Larson started doing tech edge training to raise everybody's tech capability so more people could figure this out. But instead of senior leadership pushing, well, we've got to save some money, it was up to the people in the business going, well, we don't like doing this. We could go do something much higher value. Let us automate this. And it's a much better way, in my opinion, to do it. You can't always do this, but if you have a great team, this is the way to go. So free you up to do the things you care about. <coughs> Deloitte's lessons learned, I'm just going to shoot through them because, as I said at the beginning, experience is what you get when you didn't get what you wanted. <coughs> Governance is fundamental. Um, you've got to think about how you're going to govern knowledge management. Um, you know, it's kind of weird, but you, know, you kind of need to know up front how you want to govern this thing. Is it going to be done centrally? Is it going to be done in the businesses? How are you going to do your business case? Secondly, you've got to define knowledge in your business. So if knowledge management in your business needs to focus on the customer, then do that. Remember that long list we had at the beginning? Customer, innovation, process improvement, knowing what you know, etc. Define knowledge management around those terms. Think about a formal knowledge management approach. Um, the organic approaches and so forth really don't work. And there are enough people who've written great books, and Stan Garfield sitting right here in the room, they know how to lay out a knowledge management program. If you didn't do 101 with Stan, you can always catch him next year. Um, start with a formal program. Um, continually making the business case. I know it sucks, but you've got to keep doing this. Um, even in an organization where you have a big scale and it feels like you've got some momentum, you've still got to make the business case. You've got to continually be doing it, bringing metrics to leaders, changing the metrics, improving the metrics, bringing the ones that matter. And you're not producing financial statements here. You're producing metrics that will get their attention. So you're not trying to say you know, every month this is what the site is doing. You go, here are the highlights, people. These are some great things that have happened. And you focus on what gets their attention and what matters in their business. They don't need another 75-page report. They need one slide that's going to hit them right between the eyes on what the business can, can do through knowledge management. It's an evolutionary process. I talked about that earlier. You can't fast forward the movie, but artificial intelligence is going to make it possible for you to fast forward it pretty soon. Human aspects are the most challenging. You remember the thing I said up front, 1,074, 1,054 projects. When the projects failed, the technology worked. The human aspects are really the challenge. And then who's being faced with a point solution? One part of your business is going to build something really cool, and that'll fix knowledge management forever. But they're only doing it for one part of the business. And it's not going to talk to anything else, and it's not on your regular platform. We used to resist those things, and then in our organization, they go around and they get the money anyway, so they built the darn thing. So now we have what we call the embrace protocol, which is if somebody comes along and says, we want to build this amazing, fantastic new thing, we go, great, we're in. 
We'll pilot it with you. Have you got the money to build it? Great. We'll pilot it with you. We'll help you to be successful. And we'll pilot in the sunshine. We'll all talk about how it's going and what you're learning and everything. It's a much better model. And the Embrace model is working for us. And then finally, technology is not a panacea for knowledge management deals. But technology does show you're doing something. And AI shows you're serious about it. This is our Deloitte knowledge management model. If you go talk to Pepper the robot, she'll show you the model. If you talk to any of our knowledge management team who work with clients, come talk to me. I can tell you about the model, how it works, why it works, why we use it. And um, thank you for the four-minute warning. Um, and this is really based upon us getting it wrong a lot of times. We tell clients, don't lead with the technology. We led with the technology three times. We tell clients, think about your software choices. We went with the provider we always go with. The fact that we happen to audit them is also part of the picture. Um, you've got to realize that these are based on us learning. Why do you want to reinvent the wheel? Why do you want to bump your heads when you can just take a look at the way we did it? And this, this is not a consulting pitch. You can have this content. It's out there for the art and, of, and the science of knowledge management. Take a look at this. If it resonates with you, feel free to use it. And then finally, if you're selling knowledge, you want to be using AI. And I know I'm sounding like a broken record or a stuck DVD or a stuck iPod or an iPhone 11 that doesn't work. Managed to cover them all, right? No, 77s, I remember those two. Anyway, suffice it to say, AI needs to be a part of what you're doing. It really, really is crucial. And, and really, if you learn as much about AI as you can, you get ever closer to the business, the sharp edge of the business, where leadership notices you can add value, where you can get the numbers. This gives you the best possible chance of being super successful. But ultimately, you're going to remember, it's not about the AI. It's about the people behind the AI who shape the AI. And you, as knowledge managers, can step into that space. Um, you own the unstructured data. You understand the organization. You understand complexity. You've got a good handle on technology. And again, you own the unstructured data. So this is a chance to, to really step up and do things. I'd love to engage with any of you on your journey. Um, would love to and happily answer some questions. I think we have a, a minute or two left. There we go. If you thought it was a good presentation, step up, leave the room. <laughs> I think I'm getting 100 on that one. Um, questions, comments? Sure. Yeah, so this is a question is UNICEF and how do you get in the room if you're the, the knowledge management person because the IT guys are running artificial intelligence or innovation or any one of the rooms, yeah. So bringing them something is usually a good, good way to do it. Um, if you could say to them, listen guys, we know you're doing some AI stuff. Have you got training data? Because I can bring you some. It's not clean, it's not beautiful, but it'll at least help you get going. Actually, my team may be able to help you with the training data. That would be one thing to do. Or bring them some research from knowledge management capabilities and go, guys, did you know that this is, these are some of the trends that are happening? You could download the stuff that we have. Um, I think those would be some of the things. But just getting to know them, getting connected. Uh, with, with us, our technology department and us work really closely together. Um, but they still don't do exactly what we tell them, uh, which is a pity. Um, also, their budgets are so much bigger than ours. Um, you know, massive budgets, and they get to do things like, here's our Christmas list, everybody gets a new iPhone if you want one. I can't compete with that in terms of motivation and stuff like that. So it's not like you can ever take over the IT department, but being there supporting, helping, guiding, shaping it, helping them to be successful, they'll remember you, um, and you're at the table, and you're in the room when it happens. 